I V M. Hey, before we start this week's episode, I want to share something that I'm really, really excited about. Ronnie Scruella is in the house, and his show, Dreaming with Your Eyes Open, drops every Tuesday. It's a podcast about his entrepreneurial journey, and that's going to be super exciting and inspiring. You can catch it on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcast from. Whatever you are learning in institutes, and even in great institutes, is getting obsolete very rapidly. Mm. And because it is getting obsolete very rapidly, I think that people just need to keep, you know, upgrading themselves at at various intervals. And our education system isn't built around that. It is built around okay, I am going to give you all the inputs at one go, and then you are going to be capable of just becoming a CEO after becoming an MBA, which is ridiculous. Mm. And I think that that premise itself is broken. My first meeting with Siddharth Deshmukh was when I met him at the Mica campus. It was my first year as a visiting faculty there, and I was asked to meet this guy who was soon to be associate dean. I was fully prepared to meet an elderly citizen, greying copiously, and probably in some sort of a formal attire that involved a jacket. Instead, I met this quirky, lanky character with an infectious smile who put you at ease in seconds. After spending a day or two with the students, I realized quickly that not only was he popular, but he was a phenomenon at the campus, a legend, someone loved and respected in equal measure. Siddharth teaches in over six different institutes, including premier business schools across the country. He's an author, a successful serial entrepreneur, and has also mentored hundreds of students in their startup journeys. But what draws me to him is his absolute love for teaching. He doesn't see it as a profession. He doesn't do it to gain or share knowledge, but he practices it as an art form, and he is a master at it. Welcome to the show, Siddharth. Hey, my pleasure, my pleasure entirely. So, um, I always wanted to ask you this. Okay. You and I met a few years back. Yeah. Uh, in the campus at Mica. Yes. Where I was a visiting faculty, and uh, you were in Mica. Yeah. And I saw an extraordinary buzz around you. Okay. <laughs> Part of it is uh, is you yourself and your the passion you bring in, the attitude you bring into this. But part of it is also the moment you say, "Sid, how students react." Right? Okay. And that's when I realized, uh, you know, the the kind of person you are and everything else as well. But for you, at what point in your life did you know that you wanted to be a teacher? Okay, so a bit of background. Thank you so much for the compliments. By the way, I I, I genuinely feel blessed whenever students tend to like me. I think uh, part of the appeal is the fact that as a bad student myself, I know exactly how students think uh, <laughs> and behave and, and, and act out. So it it's uh, it's a deep connect that I have, mm. and um, I started my uh, education. My post graduation is from Mica. So I'm from the founding batch of Mica, so the oh, first wow. batch. So the first batch. Yeah, the first batch. So ninety four to ninety six. So they say that the dumb students have to come twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to come again and and be uh, uh, you know uh, an administrator and, and an educator. Uh, in but what was Mica days. back in ninety? Was it similar to what it is now? No, not at all. Right now it's like a five star golf resort <laughs> with the tennis courts and, and all. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, but at that point in time, uh, it was just like one building and uh, we literally used to have a lot of uh, snakes and hedgehogs and, and the desert and, and stuff like that. It was quite an interesting time. Wow. Um, we didn't have hostels the first year. Uh, right. We used to live in some guest house called the Sterling Guest House. I have some really illustrious batchmates like Kunal Jaswani, who's the CEO of ONL. Ogilvy. Yeah. yeah, so Ogilvy, sorry. He was my batchmate and uh, we had a lot of interesting times together uh, as as a batch. It was just a batch of 42. So that was the answer right. to the universe. <laughs> but uh, what were you seeking? Like back then, did, did Micah have cat and all of that for you to... Uh, it to was, yeah, uh, absolutely. What happens is that you are looking for answers which are not provided by normal education or normal society. Right. If you end up being going to Micah. In fact, when I was heading placements at Micah, one of the things that one of the recruiters told me was that Micah reminds me of one of those, you know, RT type of management colleges. 
But that's what it has become, right? Like, for example, right. when when I aspired to be yeah. in my career as a student, which yeah. thankfully I, I, not thankfully, unfortunately, I didn't no, for myself. In your thankfully case, for the institution <laughs> that I didn't. Yeah, okay. It was uh, it was this. It was what you said, right? It, yeah. it was a B school which appealed to someone like me. Yeah. Um, you know, who was definitely not cut out for the the regular mm. engineering uh, mm. MBA sort of thing, mm. right? Mm. And and it had this allure, you know, which was yeah. half creative, the vibe around it. Mm. Even the prospectors of my car was very different from all the others. It was, right? yeah. But in the first batch, you know, when 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 you were applying, was it the same? What what attracted you to it? So so the very fact that it was different, I think my car was started by a bunch of people who could actually create a really wonderful narrative that was attractive. Mm. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, the slogan said, the language begins here. Now it's the school of ideas, but at that point in time, it was the language begins here. And that was something which was really, really exciting for somebody like me. And uh, it, I'm sure was attractive to the rest of my batchmates as well. And we took the chance because mm. it was while you had to go through the CAT and, and stuff like that, it was a new institute. Mm. Uh, so a lot of the professors were from I am Ahmedabad and NID. So actually, in a way, I got the best of both worlds. I got design inputs and management inputs and stuff like that. Wow. And, and we had a few Mike and faculty. I think the guy who changed it uh, tremendously was Atul Tandon. Um, after, you know, the initial setup period and, and stuff like that was uh, over. Because I think what Micah and he realized at that point in time was the very same skill sets that are required for you to be in an ad agency can very well be deployed on the client side. And therefore, the entire world of marketing and brand management came into the fore mm-hmm. uh, as potential recruiters and, and stuff like that. So then... Suddenly, people started looking at Micah differently hmm. uh, from that point in time. And, wow. uh, and and I think that's when it really took off as an institute. And, and one thing I didn't know, I did not know until until recently is um, your career started with, with television. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, yeah, absolutely. I was the, I was the unfortunate uh, brand or product manager. No, not really unfortunate. But at Sony Entertainment Television, uh, I was uh, ha- managing a program called Thoda Hai, Thode Ki Zarurat Hai. Right. Uh, which was interesting because I had, I, I had never really seen a Hindi soap opera. And, and it was so funny uh, that I had to deal with something like that. Um, so so you're, you're many things yes. and uh, I, I have a spectrum of things where I slot you in. Sure. So I'm ready usually for the most unusual stuff when it comes to you. Okay. But in spite of all this, I still cannot picture you in that scene. You can't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But go on. Huh? Okay. So one of the <laughs> one of the first assignments that I had at Sony was to actually set up a set up a fictitious match between Indians and Sri Lankans. It was an unofficial match that was to actually herald Sony's getting into cricket. Ah, okay. So I actually had to, as Muhammad Azaruddin and, and Arjun Ranatunga were the opposing captains and we had to actually cobble together two teams which were of international standard. Uh, so I did everything from booking the 1KD stadium and booking ambulances and fire wow. engines and, and stuff like that. And also telling the captains that this is not a festival match. Right. So this was like the anti-betting thing. <laughs> because right. it, it was about, you know, playing a serious game of cricket when it was actually not official. Um, so it was... I'm assuming this must also be a time when India playing Sri Lanka was rare, and, it, unlike now. And when Jay Surya used to <laughs> <laughs> hit, 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 like, hit us like mad, and, and it was interesting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a time when Sachin was God. I guess, uh, and and Saurav Ganguly was just coming onto the scene, so it was, it was quite an interesting time uh, for me to be involved in that whole uh, scene. Uh, but yeah, I was a media guy. It's I started off my life as as a media guy. Amazing. Yeah. So after a series of uh, leadership positions, sure. uh, which I think telecom was another area where telecom, and then I went on to the dark side and started right. something of my own in digital, which I had the good sense to get out of very quickly and made a little bit of money as well. If if I may ask, what was your first startup? Uh, it was it was called Wavefront Technologies, which was a 
which was a digital agency without us knowing that it was a digital agency. Right. So at that point in time, they were I called... I think that is true even today. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they were called interactive agencies, I think, or, or design and build hmm. or something like that, or just software companies who happened to do a little bit of digital marketing. I don't know what it was. But we we had a lot of good clients. We had the United Nations as a client and, wow. and uh, for a startup. That was good, man. And we had we had Videocon and, and you know, a few others. And, and it was fun. Uh, that whole ride was fun and thankfully we got out just before the the dot com bust happened right. which was good but so uh, you 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 sold it out to someone uh, yeah we we merged uh, nice. actually and it was it was uh, it was it was a good uh, way to actually change uh, and and do something else and uh, over this period of time i found myself uh, migrate to the uk uh, along with my family and uh, you know uh, get involved in more and more digital ventures I was leading a kind of a double life hmm. because while I was doing that, I was also, you know, uh, teaching and I was also uh, writing and teaching and stuff like that. In the UK? Uh, not in the UK. I was actually teaching when I used to come back to India. Into India. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I was like this ninja teacher. <laughs> right. <laughs> who used to teach and then go back and do, do my day job. And over a period of time, I realized that, you know, maybe that's what I want to do. Mm. And that's that's how I'm here. Sorry, but that's just getting ahead of the <laughs> the chase. <laughs> no, but but that's a, that's a great point uh, in the story, right? Uh, okay. What what about teaching? Do you enjoy? Okay, you're opening up a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> but I I actually think that teaching is a performance art, mm. and I think that teaching is like stand up comedy, in the sense that for my classes and my students will testify to that. I don't have uh, any presentations. There's a reason why, because in in a in a an era of, of short attention spans, you need to be able to actually just look at it as if it's a performance, mm. wherein you are capturing this rare um, you know attention uh, and eyeballs or whatever you want to call it. So it's a very interactive sort of uh, atmosphere that I that 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 I managed to create in class, and mm. I get inspired by stand-up comedy. Not that I'm a fantastic comic, but I just am inspired with the way in which uh, a stand-up comedian knows where he's going, mm. uh, but yet keeps it spontaneous. Mm. And uh, it's that thin line between spontaneity and yet knowing what the outcomes of that class are, which right. which is very exciting for me. The improv nature uh, of it. The improv nature of it. Right. And I always like to feel that if you have a lot of knowledge, that makes you a good student. Mm. That doesn't make you necessarily a good teacher. <laughs> and I think that's where most people get it wrong because they think that, okay, this guy has a lot of knowledge, so he must be a good teacher. But actually, for you to be able to convert that knowledge into something which is digestible and something that can inspire somebody uh, in class to take action is probably what uh, a teacher is supposed to do. And hmm. I just love that part of, uh, you know, the, the whole act. I've never heard this approach to, to teaching. teaching at all. Right? Uh, <laughs> So, see, uh, you know, uh, at a completely different spectrum, sure. yeah. right? someone who's probably just scratching the surface on, well, compared to you, uh, I, I found teaching to be, and now that uh, I've been doing this for about three years or so. No, by the way, you get I, great feedback from, no. from people at <laughs> my class. Yeah, they, I think you. they love you. Yeah. Thank you. But I find it, uh, my for me, the biggest surprise in, in this whole exercise was how physically and mentally consuming it is. Oh, it right? is. You are totally wiped out, aren't you? At the end of the day, you just you just going back to your uh, hostel room and you just oh, just you're wiped out. You you have yeah. no idea what to do. You just and and plus your mind is buzzing. Yeah, isn't yeah. it? And 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 a really good class tends to do that when when your students are, you know, on the edge and they are taking you to places where you know you haven't been taken before mm. uh, from a thought perspective. And it's those moments in classes which which I really look forward to when right. that, that unplanned eureka thing when some something new comes up hmm. in hmm. class which is that whole impromptu thing because you go in with a, with a theory say you know I'm supposed to teach the law of diffusion of innovation for hmm. instance hmm. and and I go in and some dude comes up with an insight right. which just lights the the class up and then we are having this discussion about toxic masculinity hmm. and whether it's working uh, uh, is the law of diffusion of innovation working uh, with Gillette uh, as an example and that's when you actually find out that alright you know there are things that you can plan for in a hmm. class and there are things that you can't plan for hmm. and hmm. Uh, it's your job as a curator 
right. of that classroom to make sure that it it all works. So, so if if I'm a student signing up for yeah okay Siddharth class okay right, what is a good day for me? What what am I taking away? What are you taking? What are you hoping I'm taking away from there? A concept, hmm. at least hmm. a concept, a practical application of that concept, inspiration to try out that concept, hmm. an ability to feel inspired about the subject that was taught. Hmm. If I have achieved that, we are good. Because you are talking one class, right? So one concept. Hmm. It's application, inspiration to try and try it out, and yeah, yeah, subject. अच्छा लग रहा है. I am hmm. I am liking this subject now. You know, and that's good because a lot of people like, for example, I teach a lot of digital subjects. Hmm. So a lot of people are inherently scared of technology. Right. Like, are you sure I'll be able to manage this? I left a job in Infosys to join my car, and the last thing I want to do is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, get into technology again. So if I am able to convert your mind about something like this and make you understand that. uh you know you don't need techies but you need fuzzies as well hmm. uh who can who can develop stories around uh, you know uh technology then that's that's a victory for me but uh you know we are in india yeah and our system i'm assuming and you will know this better is not really conducive to to this form of a refined learning right what is your take on how we teach as a country see i think various professors have different styles and methods of teaching uh and i think that should be encouraged mm. so that's one uh secondly i think that teaching itself is going through a huge challenge mm. then the challenge is because of what we understand as information symmetry in the sense if a student is able to identify ki sir ye jo aap slide dikha rahe ho that comes from uh, linkedin slide share Uh, you know slide number 34 okay you're jacked as a teacher mm. so there's no so there's no leverage that you actually have as a teacher which uh, the student cannot really get. so you're not teaching knowledge over there so basically what you're teaching is a point of view mm. an approach mm. towards the whole subject and i think that that is the key difference that i would like to see teachers bring about to the table mm. now, if you look at most teachers they are into knowledge sharing a knowledge sharing is good and it should be done but is it enough right. i i don't know whether it's enough i think if i am able to actually move from knowledge sharing to knowledge construction or creation mm-hmm. wherein the student is a co-creator along with the teacher and we are able to build new things together based upon a class discussion then i think that that approach is much more engaging than hmm. uh, you know death by powerpoint <laughs> <laughs> so so that's 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 how i would see it i think that the approach the, the change in approach that i would really encourage teachers to have is to to give a point of view to students hmm. which they can own and own and and, and use in their professional lives but that's that's a function of systems also right mm-hmm. like the, the uh, like if, if i'm teaching for example electronics right? yeah i might have a point of view mm-hmm. on on technology i might have a point of view on why we are doing this mm-hmm. is this a means to an end mm-hmm. or not whatever mm-hmm. right i might also have a point of view on how we want to go about understanding electronics mm-hmm. etc sure but fundamentally that's what that's not what the student is being graded on right is is, is this How much of this is a function of the system? What is your take on that? You see, first of all, I think the teacher has way more uh, flexibility than what the teacher realizes. Hmm. You can actually, uh, you know, it's like the matrix. Some rules can be broken, some can be bent. <laughs> so <laughs> you you have the ability to bend a lot of rules. You hmm. have the ability to actually develop your own system. You have the ability to actually uh, create uh, your own tests and and your own ways of uh, and your own metrics of actually looking at the way in which classes. um go so i think the the most important thing maybe for a visiting faculty you actually have lesser exposure to how the mm. system works mm. but at mica for instance we encourage teachers to come out and actually give their point of view or, or share their strategic approach and and that's perfectly valid i think mm. that's that's the need of the hour in any case so teaching is sharing a point of view i think that's, so that's as a fantastic place for us to take a a very okay. short break sure We'll be right back at okay. the Filter Coffee Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. 
So we have something really exciting in store for Star Wars fans. After a successful first edition of the Geek Fruit Cantina, we're back with another. Come celebrate Star Wars Day with us. That's May the 4th with Geek Fruit at the Cuckoo Cafe in Bandra. That's in Mumbai. We have a super fun evening planned with a live podcast featuring special guests, Star Wars merchandise up for grabs, Dinkers games, along with Star Wars themed food and cocktails. You don't want to miss this. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus talks to food blogger and restaurateur Parzen Patel, the lady behind Bavi Bride. They talk about the love and evolution of Pasi cuisine, funny English street names, and her new podcast, Not Just Dansak, which you'll be able to listen to on this very network starting this Tuesday. On the second episode of the Ronnie Skruwala podcast, Dreaming With Your Eyes Open, Ronnie Skruwala talks to me about the importance of failure, how age shouldn't be a deterrent for entrepreneurship, and setting the right expectations for your venture. On Thalle Harate, a Kannada podcast, Lalita Pulavarti joins Pawan Srinath on episode 20. They talk about the challenges faced by the 470 million plus children in India. On What a Player, Akash Mehta and Siddharth Deja are joined by sports writer Vivek Krishnan. They talk about why Bangalore should be in the top four spots and a lot more. On Dating is Garbage, three IVM dudes discuss their dating lives with Janam and share their stories around love, friendship and sex. On Simplified, we have the founder of Kranti Art Theory, Romario Rodriguez. He joins Chuck and Naren as they talk about talent management and integrating various art genres. On Football Twaddle, the boys are back to discuss last game week's EPL results and the heated battle for top four placement. On Gold Gappa, model turn actress Aditi Govitrikar joins Tripti where she talks about motherhood, practicing psychology and her career as a model. And with that, let's move on with your shows. Welcome back to the Filter Coffee Podcast. We are speaking with Siddharth Deshmukh. Sid, uh, before we went on a break, you were talking about you know how MICA as an institution uh, allows you to bring in a point of view strategically as a as a teacher, right? Uh, but what about institutions outside? What is your take on the the larger education system that we have? I think the education system is is on the verge of disruption. Mm. Uh, I think it's broken already in a lot of places. Mm. I think one of the reasons why uh, uh, an institution like MICA is a standout in the post-graduation phase is because there are very few uh, that actually do the job in an undergraduate uh, place, which is why I'm quite happy to be teaching at a place like Flame. Uh, which is uh, one of the liberal education places uh, in India, one of the few liberal education places in India, wherein I think that if you give younger people the chance to learn new things and and cutting edge things uh, at at an age wherein they can actually make a difference and an impact to the world, it does make a, make uh, a world of a difference. So, I so think, sorry to interrupt your flow, yeah, no but worries, for the uninitiated, yeah. what does liberal education mean? Liberal education is okay. So you had so in in your day and mine, I, I suppose we had science, arts, and commerce, right? Uh, and and maybe that's what you graduated in and in engineering and in medicine, etc. Now, liberal education is a new way of looking at, uh, you could look at it as an amalgamation of arts and economics and, and even mathematics. So it's just a way in which you can have a very different kind of education, uh, which allows you a much more rounded view. And it's not really dependent on the kind of arts education that is being taught uh, in most of the colleges in, in, in countries. So you can learn things like painting, you can learn things like music, you can learn things like sculpture, you can learn things like, you know, digital at the same time. Uh, you, you can learn things uh, which, are, which are quite a mixture of um, uh, events and, mm. and situations. So I, entrepreneurship, uh, so it, it's a mixture. And that's why what it is. So that's why it's so dif- difficult to define, right? Because mm. it's liberal and it's, right. it's completely open. Hmm. But having said that, I mean, that's fantastic. But I think there are two or three key underlying systemic factors, which is why education is getting disrupted. One of the things is that whatever you're learning in institutes, and even in great institutes, is getting obsolete very rapidly. Hmm. And because it is getting obsolete very rapidly, I think that people just need to keep, you know, upgrading themselves at, at various intervals. And our education system isn't built around that. It is built around, okay, I'm going to give you all the inputs at one go, and then you are going to be capable of just becoming a CEO after becoming an MBA, which is ridiculous. Mm. And I think that that premise itself is broken. Um, because at the end of it, after having taught strategy and, and, and stuff like that to poor MBA students, they're going out and starting entry-level jobs. Mm. So clearly, the education system needs to evolve to a place wherein it actually starts contributing at various points of time in your career. So you and I should also be actually part of the educational system mm. uh, rather than be out of it uh, and, and learn new things, which I think probably online, it's happening to, to quite some extent. But somewhere, there's, there's, it looks like there's going to be a massive disruption. 
The second point that is also huge, probably more in the US, less, but not so much less in, in, in India is the amount of money you have to pay. And because you have to pay, you take loans. So there's debt. And that debt is, is quite a tough one because the moment you take debt, it does mean that you have to look out for the best possible job off campus, even though it may not necessarily fulfill your soul. Mm. So that means that you're going to take that job and get stuck in a place which doesn't really fulfill you because you've got a loan to pay off. And that's the harsh reality. So that's something which is another issue that education probably has. The mm. third is, I think there's, there's, a, there's an inherent tension between academics who are also have to produce research papers uh, and, and develop uh, original pieces of research, which is great, which is excellent. You have to do that. Mm. But students are coming to colleges, you know, not uh, for uh, for obviously the fr the fruits of that research, but they're mm. coming to colleges to be taught and mm. to be placed. So there's a there's a difference in emphasis between maybe what the academia wants out of an institute and what students want, want out of an institute. Mm. You know, you, I could give a rat's ass about some of the papers that have been written in, in some fields. But if I'm being taught by a professor who inspires me and, and I can use that and I can rock my summer training and I can get placed somewhere, well, you've got something made. Mm. On the other hand, you have some guy like Clayton Christensen who's written uh, this, uh, the, the law that I mentioned, the law of uh, the innovator's dilemma, let, let's say. And then that changes the industry. Mm. So I think that Academia, industry and students have not really managed to get their act together, uh, wherein the research from academia is really helping industry at a real time basis. Uh, industry is not really contributing to academia back again hmm. with funded projects to make sure that the research stays true and on course. And students are getting more and more divorced from both industry and, and academia in, yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Education has a lot of challenges and uh, some of them are solvable, some of them are not. Right. I was just reading a, a, a lovely long form article, I think it's in the first post print mm -hmm. edition, mm -hmm. which said that that's a very worrying statistic that only about 3.4% of engineers yeah. produced by this country are employable. Mm. And that number is the early 7% for an MBA. Mm. Right? We're not talking about you know, becoming a CEO. We're talking about being employable at all. Correct. Right. That's a very drastically. I mean, if 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 there was a red flag, yeah, that should have probably been raised. I'm assuming when it was thirty percent or something like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, what what are we doing fundamentally wrong? I think societally, uh, India is very conscious of getting a degree. Hmm. Okay, it it plays an important part in, in your uh, variety of things. So if I have to be politically incorrect, it makes you more marriage, marriageable. If if it, it makes you more, uh, you know, uh, accepted, hmm. it, it just allows you freer access to um, an MBA, <laughs> wherein you get a job as a consultant after doing four years of engineering. So it's essentially a path that has been kind of trodden because there have been no other paths that have been trodden. Hmm. Now, for instance, what is stopping any institute uh, from saying, okay, if you're an entrepreneur and you've gotten through an institute, okay, here's a path for you wherein you don't have to sit for classes or these classes. Uh, you can run with your idea and uh, we'll fund you and we'll give you one year off from placement and try and make this work. So then you have a charged up entrepreneur full of energy, full of passion, full of enthusiasm, who has the ability to actually create jobs. Forget mm. look out for a job, but actually create jobs for others. But very few institutes are actually incentivized to do something like this. Mm. All institutes are incentivized to actually, uh, you know, run the, the trodden path. And I think that is because maybe... In India, we are still at a place in our economy wherein we want to, we are in maybe survival stage. We are, we are still in, in that survival mode. We are not into, oh, okay, no fear of failure sort of thing, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. probably exists in some of the Western countries. But, uh, you know, if I were to just go back to these numbers slightly again, yeah, are we fundamentally very different from the rest of the world? For example, Europe and, 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 and the US? Or is this probably fairly true in other countries as well? The unemployability. This is what I keep telling my students. So I've yeah. taught in a variety of places in India and, and a little bit outside as well. And one of the things that I realize is that if I start talking of Netflix, hmm. I seriously will not be able to know where I am. Everyone's talking of 
the same characters everyone's talking about the same pe- people everyone's inspired by the same kind of series so there's a lot of similarity as well in the students hmm. but the system around the students that that exists say in the us or in the in the uk or or in europe and the system around students maybe in india maybe we have a little bit of catching up to do because hmm. face it we are young we are you know we have just started uh, as as compared to some of these uh, countries hmm. and we are getting there uh, and and i'm very proud of the fact that i'm part of that whole uh, you know uh, revolution if i if i have to say but we have a long way to go from you know memory based learning to something which is uh, truly exciting and adventurous hmm. some of it is directly connected to the fact that hey i need to get a job my family depends on me Mm. and so you can't be very adventurous when when something like this uh, is also uh, a truth so right. we have to traverse our own unique path i think we'll we'll find our way but uh, coming back to okay. to sidat okay uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh you you presently and of course you're being extremely modest about it but you actually teach in over six different institutes in india right which include sure. some of the biggest names sure like sp jain and symbiosis yeah, 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 yeah. and i am etc right sure um but one thing i've noticed is you don't teach at least at mica which i know well you don't teach regular subjects uh, <laughs> what are the what are the two things you teach at mica i love it the way you say regular subjects i i, I love the fact that i teach irregular subjects yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead of so instead of digital marketing i teach marketing in a digital world because i think that the world itself is changed mm. because of digital and so therefore marketing needs to change in a digital world mm. i teach something called customer experience design mm. i teach something called digital futures where i explore ai and i explore uh, you know uh, how big data is going to change things right so those are the sort of subjects that i teach and and the reason why they are irregular is because those are un- unfortunately required but not mainstream so far Hmm. So I've chosen to actually. When you say it, it, it's required and not mainstream, you mean? Um, do you mean to say our approach to teaching marketing should be different? I think so. So okay, so let's let's kind of unpack this a little. Hmm. Um, normally, you have marketing. I think the way in which we are teaching marketing, and I do not mean only India. I, I think I, I can make the statement globally. Marketing is an applied discipline. Hmm. Marketing draws a lot from. biology it draws a lot from uh, anthropology anthropology yeah. sociology you know structure systems etc we hardly teach anything about these subjects before we get to the application of those principles hmm. so in my classes what i tend to do is draw out from first principles and then build on marketing concepts rather than you know just talk about the usual tried and tested target audience demographic psychographics and and the rest of it which probably you can read in any uh, any any textbook and hmm. be none the wiser for it hmm. but if i teach you how the the human brain works and which part of the human brain i need to connect to especially if i am talking about twitter then we are having a real conversation Mm. where where in people's minds are ignited suddenly and and then you say oh okay so that's what's really happening mm. but if i uh, you know if i were to just look at the the courses sure. right I, i entirely agree with you yeah. right uh, we are teaching it as, a, as as an applied discipline yeah but part of it is also because and this is true for various other disciplines also but especially yeah. in marketing this is you being trained for a vocation mm-hmm. you being trained for a profession yes right? I was not at all surprised to see different courses you know when I went through that for the first time in an institution these courses are pretty much how agencies and mm. uh, brands are structured Correct. and companies and marketing engines yes. are structured yes so there's a paid media uh, you know paper there's something on programmatic mm. uh, there's something on content yeah. and social media etc yeah. right yeah yeah is, is this because the industry is doing it is is that are we as industry reflecting upon education yeah. how we are structured yeah and so to be honest i'm quite disappointed in industry mm. Mm. uh in, in the sense that there are so many intelligent things that uh, the industry can teach us but they're not because they're looking at the next quarter mm. so they're also being driven by their clients so when they come to an educational institute and i don't i i think one of the reasons why you're liked by the way karthik is you don't follow that path <laughs> okay but a lot of the people who come from industry are teaching things which will make 
their clients not their heads wisely but uh, you know actually are not really adding any point of view or any strategic uh, mm. approach to uh, a student now i believe that if you go to first principles uh, on any subject whether it's marketing or you know digital or anything i need to be in a situation wherein i am able to contribute a significantly different point of view so suppose i am this young budding summer trainee and i am employed at at your place right now the only way in which i can catch karthik's attention is if i say oh but we are not doing it because the actor network theory uh, is is being violated by by this campaign it won't work mm. i'll have your attention and most of the times students are not going to say that mm. because they have no idea what this is <laughs> they have yeah. no idea what what the actor network theory is they have no idea how it's being violated and they have no idea but but to be honest this is something which will differentiate a student from mm. Uh, anything else yeah. if if I, if that person can go to uh, you know first principles and actually derive a strategic approach from that that's the fastest way uh, mm. up and i genuinely feel that if we can make people think like this it will be amazing for the discipline and i think academia has to take a lead role in shaping people to think differently about marketing mm. a lot of your answers use the phrase first principles yes uh, is that in a way what you uh, expect or what you desire out of this process that people understand the fundamentals of something yeah and uh, not get lost in the hmm. applications of it yeah see it's very easy to hide behind jargon is what hmm. i've hmm. actually understood uh, so in any class uh, whenever somebody says oh but the target audience so i i immediately stop that person okay. and say okay please tell me what target audience actually means to you and so we kind of de-jargonize everything to an extent wherein it becomes dumb enough for you know everybody's grandmothers to understand mm. uh, now the whole thing is that if you have the ability to do that then you have the ability to explain a concept in a very simple way but not simple simplistic but in a simple but effective way to uh, people across the table mm. i think that can only happen if you understood something very deeply okay and that's what i mean by first principles mm. and first principles obviously so if i look at marketing marketing is deeply connected to what let's say culture i would even go deeper than that mm. i'd say changing somebody's mind mm. okay or changing somebody's behavior so then i have to understand okay so what changes somebody's behavior okay so then i say okay biological hote hai kuch to factors so i'll say okay so then i'll say okay so what changes bi- biological factors I'll say okay. So then, how is the human brain constructed? Ah, okay. So there's this emotional brain, and there's this prefrontal cortex, and mm-hmm. there's this medulla oblongata, which is like the and the reptilian part of the brain. Okay, so which part of my advertising message is actually being communicated to the subconscious right now? How is it invoking the reptilian brain, and is it really doing a good job? Is it hacking into your subconscious? Mm-hmm. Okay. So now, if I can then. talk about nudging and priming as techniques that have the ability to do that and and connect it to fundamental principles of bi- biology then i will be a much better marketer hmm. right i like to build build upon uh, constructs like this where when i move from anthropology or or biology or uh, even systems and structures uh, it's just if like for i'll give you another example if i have to look at customer experience design if i have to look at so what makes powerpoint put people to sleep okay and if i just look at the way in which powerpoint is designed one of the first things i tell students is if you want to make great powerpoint presentation write a word document first hmm. and then try to convert that into 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 a powerpoint because a lot of times you're putting out your own thoughts which you would rather speak through and use that as as just a reference point or something that will lead the discussion but most people don't do that and it's because of an inherent inability to understand why a medium is being used and how it impacts the brain in front of you hmm. right because the medium is the message as mr marshall mcluhan said yes yes so it's just things like this when you kind of deconstruct them uh, either anthropologically or biologically or sociologically that you start finding surprising answers which hmm. which i tend, tend to uh, let's say co create in class that's amazing yeah no no wonder i'm a big fan of uh, the last few batches of people who have met from okay. mica we are talking about a very higher order okay. right and uh, i i'm assuming you might find it difficult to control 
some of the other inputs going into the the student's brain as well which is you know other faculty visiting yes. or otherwise yes. you know, across all these institutes correct right? so in a way this is a this is a uh, you probably one or few of of the lone rangers who are taking a very radical approach to this yeah. right true this must have resulted in some really magical moments in your class oh 100% what, what what's what's the most uh, memorable for you so i used to say to students close but no cigar you know you you're very close and so one guy said when the heck am i going to get a cigar <laughs> so <laughs> so he sat for my classes again uh. a shout out to aditya nishadam mm. uh, he sat for my classes again and he earned that cigar so i had to buy a damn cigar from, from the uk and give it to him because he actually sat for as a senior he sat for the junior foundational course and he right. said okay i have earned that cigar give the damn cigar to me okay because i have i have understood first principle so that was a absolute can, can, can you talk a little bit more about what he did okay so basically we were try, we i think we were trying to understand information symmetry mm-hmm. and, and its impact on on the way in which people um, craft messages so right. I don't want to bore uh, you on on the depth of it, but essentially he was just so close to towards answering uh, that question, uh, but losing his the the plot at that. Another thing, another instance I'd like to give you is once I showed everybody movies and then mm. I spoiled those movies for them. So I was teaching a class on entrepreneurship. Uh, so I created a WhatsApp group. I said, anyways, you guys are on WhatsApp groups, right? Mm. So might as well. use those whatsapp groups we saw the founder and we saw the social network okay i love the founder yeah so if you love the founder you'll know exactly what happened transpired later on mm-hmm. so i was sitting in the class in the auditorium you've seen mike's auditorium so i was sitting there and so i asked so what is mcdonald's business model in the first 15 minutes of the film so everyone's like tick 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 little meter typing happened I asked the same question again say 30 minutes later I asked the same question 45 minutes later so it was the same question and there were different answers right because then you slowly realize that it has many depths to it and wow. you you actually have real estate factored in as well and and so on and so forth so I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, experiment on how to how to take a class really That's awesome. Do, do you do the same films over or do you do no, multiple things, films over? No different time. Yeah, yeah. I I normally don't repeat the material right uh, i yeah. i think like a stand up comic of course so you yes. cannot repeat the material you have, <laughs> you have to keep it fresh you have to keep it fresh yeah i'm just wondering if uh, you know i had this this there was one point in 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 time uh, in life where mm-hmm. i wanted to take up uh, poker professionally oh nice and um, i i always believe that you give me a a life situation uh-huh. any life decision rather uh uh-huh. I can equate it to a decision on the poker table. Brilliant. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, it, of course, this later on went on to to us actually making a a, a film on it. Oh wow! But okay. uh, but more importantly, I always felt that poker is a wonderful tool to to teach decision making. It is uh, absolutely. You know the the restrictions, the constraints you have, yeah. and the data you know and yes. don't know, etc. Right. Mm. Anyway, so that was just something that I got no, reminded awesome, when you were saying. But you should this. do something yeah. about it. You should connect it to uh, you know some decision making in in the digital subjects that you teach. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Maybe you can show them some bits of rounders or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I was actually thinking of yeah, the same film. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you you mentioned uh, you know entrepreneurship. And, yes, and and that's a uh, that's another big part of your life. Yes, right? uh, I've had the privilege of. Uh, being a small part of that journey for you oh you were when, an amazing when, part of it uh, when when we did that whole shark yeah. tank type thing yeah. uh, at mica absolutely where we invited all the people from amdabad yeah. right all the yeah. students from amdabad yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah yeah but i've also seen uh, you also mentored um, one on one more than you know 150 yeah, yeah. students is that 175 the... and counting yeah wow yeah wow, wow. one such um, what has been that experience for you has any of them went on to start an organization it's a business yeah. shout out to akash sachdev who has started rebel rebel rights, rebel yeah, rights. Yeah, i love the yeah. guy yeah yeah, yeah yeah so yeah. he's he's uh, one guy who's actually done justice to to the whole damn thing uh, some some of the others have started uh, their projects after uh, getting out of mica maybe not immediately Uh, so there's there's a guy called Dhananjay Sena who started something around music, and there's uh, there's a few others as well. Um, sorry for all the guys I'm forgetting because there's been 175 of you. Of uh, there are people uh, if you recall, uh, you know, the Let's Play gang and, yes. and stuff like that. So yes. all of these guys have been very enthusiastic and and energetic about their whole journey into entrepreneurship, hmm. but student debt. 
and job and societal pressures mm. and the fact that you have to get a job mm. and what will your parents say and how the hell are you going to get married all those things come and start biting you in the ass when when you start getting out so that is something that i haven't yet been able to crack hmm. one of the things that we are looking at doing is to actually not keep it for the last 6 months at myca but actually keep create a completely different entrepreneurial track hmm. and see how it goes so give them the cover of 2 years and make sure that it works so that they actually have uh, so we will be creating our own loon shots by the way I, i don't know if you've read this book called loon shots i haven't yeah. it's amazing you got to yeah. read it so we'll be creating our own we, we, we're going to do a longer elongated yeah. section on uh, we'll do that. what what one should read at the end of this episode <laughs> uh, but uh, you know you when i asked you this question you you responded with the word abysmal yeah right? and uh, i remember one incident and I, i don't know if this is what you were referring to mm. uh, this particular group um, they were extremely excited and, and their uh, spirit was uh, was infectious right? mm. i remember i was one of the people who were trying to mentor them and uh, I, it was it was brilliant you know the yeah. conversations i had yeah. the kind of follow ups they had yeah. and then there was this last week on campus and then uh, some of them i think went to bangalore some yeah. of them elsewhere and then radio silence yeah it just it just ended just like that yes right? does it happen a lot yeah and 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 there's very human reasons for it mm. uh, essentially a lot of the times the energy is dissipates because the context goes away mm. so we what we must remember is this this mica community or any educational community is an ev- collaborate and evaporate sort of community mm. it's going to go away so the moment it goes away then the whole venture kind of falls through so the the whole idea should be to try and nurture it while they're there and use the context as, as strongly as possible we still have to crack that one right. i haven't i haven't been able to crack there's something beautifully tragic in this it right? is incredibly yeah, tragic yeah, trust yeah. me because so many ideas and i've seen the same ideas get funded 2 years later hmm. big time funding and i was like oh man <laughs> just think they about it they were almost it. there yeah, yeah they were almost there yeah. it's amazing yeah, yeah. but but uh, i think one team that uh, has certainly not dropped the ball in fact i think they're building something really really exciting uh, yeah. people in your own home uh, yeah uh, my my kids what is iconic cakes <laughs> iconic cakes oh god i am the least digital person in my family my kids aged 15 and 16 their daughters of mine they run a really famous instagram account uh, which is called iconic cakes it's a combination of makeup and comedy and i don't know what the hell they do but they have this natural born killer <laughs> narrative ability to actually communicate they've got 500000 followers wow and they are rocking it and they keep telling me that i don't understand digital right as a concerned father i was wondering what was going on so i checked out their account and i realized that most of their peer followers are you know kindred souls like they they uh, you know a they're female and they're in the same age group so it's it's quite inspiring i'm i'm mm. really inspired by my kids to be honest mm. i'm not a proud parent i'm a stunned parent <laughs> I think inspired enough uh, to actually do a course on, or rather a, a doctorate on. Yeah, uh, no, on so I, yeah, right? I began thinking about it, and I yeah. said, "Hey, if I can learn from these kids, then yeah. why not do a PhD on something like this?" So, one of the things that I'm toying with is to understand influencer marketing mm. and whether it can actually impact social causes, mm. because there's this big disconnect between brands right. and social causes. and influencers so because brands want to get involved in social causes they don't know how to influencers are connected with brands but to mixed results uh, when i say influencers i don't mean celebrities right i mean natural born influencers yes. uh, like yes. pewdiepie or whatever mm-hmm. um, and social causes or movements and if we can find a way or develop a model or a construct that kind of brings the three together in a strong fashion so that's the thing that i'm exploring beautiful and uh, you know one thing i almost forgot okay. uh, to ask you um, you also written two books yes and one of them very very early in your career right? which is a very <laughs> unlikely thing to do at the yeah, beginning yeah i was mad enough to think that i could write books i'm a terrible writer so i stopped that pursuit <laughs> very quickly <laughs> the first the first one it was called the map that matters Hmm. uh it was my take on on the human mind and it was way before i actually understood uh, a lot of the intricacies that i understand now uh, so it probably is a little shambolic but i think the core insight is still valid mm-hmm. and i think that it could 
uh, help a lot of people if they read it. But I'm not trying to push my book because I think that that ship has sailed. Uh, so I, I've also written a book called The Gift of the Gab, hmm. which was, uh, you know, um, basically the gift of the gab. And, oh. and what really is the gift of the gab and, and the secret of language and how to use it. But it was a story. It was in story form. Uh, I've begun writing poems on Facebook. I've noticed that. Yes. And that has been getting some really strange responses. Uh, but that's that's good. Uh, I'm just exploring that. And and uh, since you mentioned it, you're the traveling professor on, uh, on, Instagram. on Instagram. Yes, you right? can find me there. Just spelt like traveling and yeah, professor. Yeah, the traveling professor. Yeah. Right, right. You know, uh, Sid, usually we do like a last two minute, 30 second segment. Okay. Uh, but in your case, I think we yeah, do an done. entire <laughs> episode uh, okay. on uh, what you're reading. Okay. All right. So what, what I'm what I'm reading right now, I would recommend a, a book given by a student of mine called Strategy. Uh, it's excellent. Just that strategy. Just strategy. Okay. And it actually encapsulates uh, the world of strategy and how it's development in history and, and right till where we are. And, and so it's, it's very interesting, very, very intelligently done. Another book uh, called Loon Shots. Which is which is quite interesting too. It's written by a guy called Safi Bahkal, and it was, uh, it's it's really amazing. It's uh, it's something about how to nurture crazy ideas. Oh wow! Through the structure, and it's it's very interesting. So I would certainly recommend these two books straight up. Wonderful, and and what are you watching these days? Oh, okay. So I just finished watching Russian Doll. I watched. What else did I watch? I watched. The Russian Doll is. Uh, where can one watch it? Netflix, uh, Russian Doll is like a uh, modern day take on spoiler alert, uh, Groundhog Day. Ah, so, so if you've seen oh, Groundhog Day, uh, Day, you'll yeah. you'll see some strange uh, similarities. similarities yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. This is most fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come out here and just yadder on like this. <laughs> <laughs> we loved it. Okay. We hope to have you back again soon. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you, Karthik. So that was our show. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IBM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter and filter underscore coffee. That's coffee with a K on Instagram. fast. If I tell you I'm Parsi, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Dansak, I don't blame you. My name is Parzan Patel. You may know me as the Bavi Bride. Though I run a popular Parsi food blog, the truth is I didn't know anything about Parsi food until I got married. It was just my luck. He turned out to be your typical sadra lega wearing, kawab khari eating Parsi boy. And the only thing I knew was Dansak, or rather how to eat it. But there's more to Parsi food than Dansak. And there is more to us than our obsession with eggs and our legendary Rani cafes. Welcome to Not Just Dansak, a fresh new show where I talk to friends, fellow Bavas and Parsi entrepreneurs about all things Bhonu. A little bit of history, a dash of Bava madness and a lot of food talk. There's more to Parsis than meets the eye and there's certainly more to us than Dansak. Join me every Tuesday as I talk to some of my favorite Parsis in the food space in India and beyond. I am the Bavi Bride and this is not just Danza. Do you have a night routine? Well, everyone has one. And the to-do list usually looks like this. Brush your teeth, set that alarm get into your pajamas and switch off those screens. But here's one more to add to that list. Tune into the Positively Unlimited podcast for a dose of positive action and tips on how to build powerful mindsets. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you tune into podcasts.